see how it looks on the screen. I think it looks good. You you need it that bright, otherwise it's gonna be dark. Now let me see if I, see how it looks when I turn the one behind you on. Oh, wait, does that help any? Or just... I don't know. I guess it's one of the tech questions. Can you people hear me? Anybody here yet? Oh, wait, that's five people. I don't know. I'm, oh, I'm not part of the show. Um, that video looks good. I'm getting out of here. I'm trying to figure out if they can hear me. Can you type something in the chat? If they can hear me. Sea Squirrel is a dedicated fan. <laughs> Only three people. What happened to everybody? Hello, hello. Can you check, Justin, if you can hear me? I'm getting on right now. I don't know what our passcode is, and this thing just went to. I don't know that they can hear me. Okay. Can you hear me? Can someone hear me? Can you tell me if you can hear me? Can somebody tell me? I can't tell. Oh, okay, my audio is getting through fine. All right, we're just going to wait a couple more minutes to see if anybody else shows up. How's everyone doing? It's my first slide. Is everybody excited? I'm excited. I love bail reform. It's so fun. It's going to wait. Okay. We'll just wait two more minutes. Oh, thank you. It was a really fun job interview. Um, it's with the uh, Southern Poverty Law Center. So it's just the initial interview. Um, I've been in private practice for since 2004 working for myself and this is the first time i've actually tried to look for a job so i'm thinking the nonprofit criminal justice world is probably going to be an okay fit but we'll see we'll see what happens but thanks it was really fun um news on the riots well this kind of has something to do with the riots as well um, but I wanted people to have a chance to learn a little bit about the Bail Reform Act. Um, oh, you can't have the, the sound turned on? Um, well, can you, I, I, I don't know if this gets saved. Um, and we can close caption it later for you also. Um, okay, uh, we have one more minute before we can, we can start, but I did post on the trials and errors, uh, blog. We have a brand new blog that's called trials and errors. I posted the, um, the motion in case you were interested and 
the um, Bail Reform Act itself. So we'll give it one or two more minutes and then we'll get started. Um, if you use the chat function, this is the first time I've ever used YouTube Live. I did a few periscopes back in the day, uh, 2016, during the RNC and the DNC when I was out there, but I've never used this function before. So if you have any questions, please, I, I really um, would like to, to see them, to hear them. The whole point of this new endeavor for me in 2021 is because I think that a lot of us individual attorneys, um, criminal defense attorneys in particular, what will the job be if I get it? A senior supervising attorney. So I'll get to, you know, fight the man on a broader scale um, at the Southern Poverty Law Center. So that's where the job is. Um, so we'll wait and see what happens. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, I, I had a great time during the interview. So that's really, that's really nice. Um, but when, I totally forgot what I was talking about. What I, what I want to do is I want people to have real knowledge. So we, we make fun of the Twitter school of law and we make fun of people learning about the law on social media and not getting it right. Um, well, that was really loud. Um, but we, we need someone to, to kind of tell people things and not just for clicks or for clout or, you know, to get monetized on YouTube, which would be nice or to be an influencer, but a knowledgeable public is a public that can actually affect change. And a lot of us are kind of sick and tired of the same old, same old and being in court and laying those bricks and, um, <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> we'll get to your humiliation in a minute, Charles, don't worry about it. Uh, and I want you guys to know, I want you guys to, to learn and to be knowledgeable because although we lawyers uh, get to practice in court because we're lawyers and we have a degree or a, a piece of paper that says we can do that, you, the public, are the ones who can advocate for change. So the more you know, Nate and Kurt, I don't know who that is. Oh, you're not talking to me. Okay. So today I thought we could talk about bail. Um, and I want to be, uh, I've never been a big advocate of um, these pushes to get rid of cash bail. Not because I want cash bail, I don't. But I think once again, what it does is it just treats the symptom. Um, and this uh, entire lean towards incarceration and detention is not gonna get fixed with cash bail. And the reason why I, with getting rid of cash bail. And the reason why I say this is because I practice in federal court a lot and we don't have cash bail in our district. There is no cash bail. In fact, the Bail Reform Act says in federal court, says the defendant must be released on personal recognizance or unsecured personal bond, which means they just have to sign a form that says, well, if they don't show up to court, they'll have to pay $100,000 or whatever else. Unless the judicial officer, who is usually the judge, unless the judicial officer determines that such release will not reasonably assure the appearance of the person as required or will endanger the safety of any other person or the community. Okay? So, in federal court, the whole initial premise is you get released. That's it. Unless they can show that you're not going to come back to court or that you're a danger to the community or to a, a particular person. If they can't just release you on your own recognizance or if they can't um, have you sign an unsecured bond, then they can formulate orders and conditions that have to be reasonable. Now, in our district, which is the District of Maryland, Normally what they want you to have is a third party custodian. And that means that you have basically a babysitter. Um, and we are always looking for third party custodians when we do our bond hearings. So we always say, do you have a third party custodian? Even if the person didn't have a prior criminal record or it's not a horrific crime or anything like that, we shouldn't have to do that because the first thing that the judge is supposed to say is, okay, you should be released. But we know that that's not what judges do. We know that judges want orders and conditions. And orders and conditions are just rules for release, whether it's um, ankle monitor, GPS, 
or curfew. Curfew is huge. So you have to have a phone in your house where your third party custodian lives that doesn't have call waiting or any other services where they'll call and you better be home like your, you know, like your mom used to do when you would say you were at your friend's house and she would call your friend's mom. I mean, no, nobody did that, right? Like that wasn't a thing that people did. Anyway, to call and say, hey, is Miriam there? And you have to be there um, at that particular time. So there's curfew, there's travel restriction, there's always travel restrictions. So when I say that the goal is always supposed to be release without any of those restrictions, that's what it's supposed to be. But the reality is we don't get that even though there is no cash bail in the federal system, as it says in the very first paragraph of the Bail, bail Reform Act, even though that's what it says, that's not what we get. We still have enormous numbers of people detained pretrial in our federal system, even though there is no cash bail. So what does this mean? If we don't look for release, if we don't have a mindset amongst our judges for not incarcerating people, getting rid of cash bail isn't going to do it. Because I want you to remember something that's pretty important, that even though excessive bail is unconstitutional because of the Eighth Amendment, no bail isn't. Um, and that's an argument that prosecutors have used throughout time, right? Like, you're not entitled to bail. You can't have excessive bail but you're not entitled to bail. So um, I can tell you that in our district, people who are accused of computer crimes, um, internet related crimes, so, or you know, money laundering, bank fraud, crimes like that, um, or you know, internet scams, um, they will be held pretrial based on dangerousness. And the dangerousness will come from the fact that the government can't monitor people's computer uses because computers are ubiquitous. We carry them in our pockets. And because the government can't monitor your computer use and you used a computer to commit a crime, you may use a computer to commit a crime again. And that makes you dangerous to society. So economic harms are viewed in the same way that somebody who you know, rapes or murders, how they're viewed. So... You're a danger to the community because you committed an economic crime and you have access to the internet and they cannot control it. So we're not set up in a way to lean against incarceration. Incarceration is the easiest way to keep tabs on someone. There's, there's no internet at, in jail. I mean, that's what they think anyway. And, you know, sometimes there's not. I mean, we know as lawyers that there usually is internet in the jail. Clients have access to the outside world to cell phones. Um, but it's easier for us to just put them in jail and say, well, now you can't commit a, um, a crime, um, even an economic crime. The other thing is flight risk. So we have had clients who are US citizens who are from other countries. Um, clients from Nigeria, for example, who have passports and who have traveled to visit family members are deemed flight risks because of their contacts with other countries. Um, which seems really unfair. So if you've ever traveled in your life and ever left the United States on vacation or because you have family abroad, you are considered a flight risk. Um, so and we're not even talking about, you know, whether you have uh, prior convictions, if you've never showed up or, or if you've missed court dates, if you have outstanding warrants, all of those things. These are things that I'm talking about with people who may have not had any contact with the criminal justice system before they show up in court. So that's the Bail Reform Act in federal court. No cash bail, it leans in favor of release without any orders and conditions at all. You're just supposed to be able to show up in court and walk out the door. Um, you know, you, the one condition is always you can't commit any other crimes, you can't break any laws. So what does, does anybody have any questions so far? Anybody have any questions about bail so far. So if you ever see me online and you can stick up for me from now on, when I say things like cash bail isn't going to change anything, right? It doesn't mean that I'm pro cash bail because I'm not. I am against incarceration as a rule. 
especially pre-trial incarceration because it goes against that whole innocent until proven guilty thing. What I am against is pretending like we've got the problem solved when really all we've solved is a, a symptom of the problem. So what we really have to do is get judges on board with releasing people. That's it. Just you got to release them. Um, and, you know, we go through this all the time. So any questions? I don't think you guys have any questions. By the way, I don't use drugs. I have really bad allergies. It's really hard for me when I do my videos. I have to kind of hold it all in. Okay. No questions. All right. So in about an hour or so, there will be a hearing from the Q shaman. Um, his name is Jacob Anthony Chansley, AKA Jacob Angeli, Angeli. And that's today at 2.30 PM our time. So I think it's 4.30 PM. I don't know, 3.30 PM. Oh, good. I'm glad you're so you're good so far. And um, he was arrested, I think, on Saturday, and they have a detention hearing. So the way that detention works um, is that, you know, they say we want to release, and he says, the government says, no, we want detention, and then there's time for a detention hearing. So everyone can kind of get together. Pre-trial services does an interview. Your client is supposed to be honest with them. Pre-trial services goes out and they uh, investigate the things that you've told them and then they come up with a report and, you know, the prosecutor makes their recommendation to the court as well. And in the Q Shaman's case, and I don't know if you remember, he's the guy that had the horns and the hat and the spear. Um, they asked for detention for him. And the allegations are pretty serious that they had gone there to assassinate uh, the members of Congress. And um, the guy actually called the FBI and was like, hey, I was there, um, uh, you wanna talk? And they said, well, yeah, come on, come on in, that would be, that'd be great. Um, so he willingly talked to them. Um, I, I don't know, I'm gonna be honest. I, I don't know if detention is correct in this case. Again, I'm always against de detention, but we're not, we're not in a position as a society, um, as a country to be able to monitor people and to make sure that society is safe. I think this guy has some serious mental health issues. And I don't think it has to stem from his belief in shamanism. Um, I am not, I, I, I don't think that like, oh, my religion is the only one or like, you can only be like Hindu or Jain or Buddhist or Muslim and that's a real religion. The problem he has is that he's a QAnon supporter. I mean, he really believes in this QAnon stuff. Um, and it, I, I don't know if that's cult-like brainwashing. I, I really, I can't understand it. I don't, I don't know. But is he a danger? Maybe, um, probably. And I think that the reason why he's a danger and he should not be released, and it's really hard for me to say that, is because I don't think he thinks the law, as it's currently written, applies to him. I think that he and the people who support him and people who are like him and people who are at the Capitol believe that this election was stolen and that all of this is illegitimate and that what they are doing isn't breaking the law at all because the law is illegitimate. So if the law is illegitimate, it's like resisting an unlawful order, right? You don't have to listen to a cop if what he's saying to you is illegal or unlawful. So their belief is that they went there, one, on behalf of the president. Um, you can see my video about conspiracy. Um, and if the president is guilty of a conspiracy, and I say yes, they were following the president's order. Um, and 
yeah, Charles, they are entering the criminal justice system for the first time. And you can tell. And one of the things I want to mention about federal court, too, is it, it, it's the big leagues. It really is. I mean, we have clients that have been in and out of the state court systems and misdemeanor courts, and they think when they show up in federal court, it's going to be the same. And it's not. I mean, you went from playing peewee to playing for, I don't know, whatever team is fantastic right now. I don't know whoever it is. The federal government is such that they will watch you commit a heinous crime 372 times before they will do anything about it. So that way, if you say, well, I didn't do it those three times, they're like, yep, but you did it these 372 other times. That's how they are. Um, my problem with the feds is, is vast and wide, but being unprepared and not good at their jobs is not one of the issues I have with them. So, you know, this is the big leagues. And when you show up in federal court, you're not just going to be able to say my bad and, and walk away. That's just not how it works. I don't think that this Q shaman has a prior criminal record. They don't mention it in the uh, paperwork. And I think that they would have if he had a prior criminal history, because that's one of the things that they use to determine whether or not someone is going to show up again. Do you obey the law? So this guy generally doesn't break the law in overt ways. Probably also, as somebody mentioned to me on Twitter earlier, his community is probably not over-policed, so he hasn't had, you know, a bunch of police around when he's smoking peyote or, you know, using his mushrooms or psychedelics or anything else that he does. So one of the issues that the government has is that he told pretrial services that he smokes marijuana three times a week, and pretrial services said, well, that's a reason why he's a flight risk because he smokes marijuana three times a week. I mean, that's kind of crazy, I think, that smoking marijuana three times a week would make you a flight risk. Um, but he lied to pretrial services, and he has publicly proclaimed his use of psychedelics um, as a regular practice for his shamanism. So um, he lied to pretrial services, which is which is never good. Um, you know, that's one of the reasons why they think that he should be uh, detained, is lying to pretrial services. I have a hard time with, um, <laughs> make me a couch rest. I have a hard time using someone's um, substance abuse history as either flight risk or danger. I mean, it's made up. And there's nothing about the guy smoking marijuana or using peyote or mushrooms that makes him any more or less of a flight risk as somebody who doesn't. I mean, and like Charles just said, like, do people who smoke marijuana and use peyote just, I don't know, do they run away from the cops? I mean, what? I mean, maybe they'll forget. But there's a way to devise a, a, a release that orders some conditions of release for this guy to be out and show up for court. For example, if he had a third party custodian who could make sure that he showed up for court, if he had to go to drug treatment, like some clients do to be able to show up for court, right? Like go and get piss tested like everybody else does. Um, you know, go to outpatient treatment, do whatever, right? Go to therapy. Um, they have mandatory counseling through pretrial services. And for some of, for some clients, it's fantastic. It's the first time they've ever been able to get services, which is terrible that our criminal justice system is being used to provide mental health services, substance abuse services. I mean, it's really bad, but that's how our country has been set up. So I think it's disingenuous to say, well, his substance abuse, the lying part, maybe, but I wonder, truly, I wonder if Q Shaman thinks that smoking peyote and using psychedelics isn't substance use or abuse because he does it as part of his shamanic rituals. So it's more religious. I don't know. What do you think? I, I mean, I think that's a way to argue it. If I were his lawyer, I would argue that, argue it that way. Um, you know, the real issue you have here, and, and I wondered this on Twitter a little bit earlier, is, is the fact that he was at the Capitol and he was confronted by law enforcement who told him to stop breaking the law. Like, hey, guy with the horns, you're, you're currently breaking the law. Can you stop breaking the law? And he said, no, I'm going to continue breaking the law. I think that it, from my perspective, if I'm a judge, um, or if I'm a prosecutor, I'm going to think that's my strongest argument. Not that he, you know, uses drugs and he lied about using drugs. 
um, that's, you know, he, he doesn't think that these laws apply to him. One of the things that I think people have been talking about is, I guess, the um, large deposits of Bitcoin to these people's bank accounts over the, the days and weeks leading up to January 6th. And it talks about this Q shaman being able to raise funds very quickly um, in an untraceable way as well, but it doesn't get into details. And I'm wondering if the hearing may in fact give us more insight into who's giving him this money because he doesn't have a job and he went from Arizona to DC um, somehow and managed to stay there and to eat and to live. So someone's funding him in being this sort of like chaos agent. Um, so, I mean, I think that's important to kind of think about with all of this too, is where's the money coming from? And I know that for my clients, you know, who are not QAnon figureheads, um, they're just regular people, where they get their money from is a huge issue. And normally by the time they're even brought into court, the feds know where that money is and where it came from and who put it in there and they've traced it all and they've tracked it all. So I'm gonna assume that they did for the Q shaman as well. Um, the other thing I want to point out is that this guy literally went to the feds on his own. He went, and when he talked to them, he said, they asked him, are you going to go back for inauguration? And he said, you betcha. I'm going to go back for inauguration. We're going to keep doing this. So is he a danger and a flight risk? Yes, but again, not because of his drug use, but because he has already indicated his intention to go back to keep doing this because he thinks he really believes this election was stolen that there's a cabal is that how you say the word um that sells children and mike pence is one of them i guess um and that he needs to go there because the president asked him to go there and protect the integrity of this nation so if he's released without a third party custodian, if he's released without GPS monitoring, which they can do, there are a lot of orders and conditions for this guy that do not require him to be incarcerated. They do not require him to be in jail. I mean, my understanding, someone correct me if I'm wrong, they actually are giving him organic food in jail right now as he's waiting. Um, and so we're going to have to keep paying for him to be in pretrial detention, we're going to have to keep paying for him to get um, uh, organic food. It, it's, it just doesn't make any sense for us to do that. Let him out, find orders and conditions that can make sure that he doesn't go anywhere. An ankle monitor is a great way to do it. You know, put him on a curfew. Say he can't leave his mommy's house. I mean, I guess he lives there anyway, literally in his base, in her basement. Um, and that that's where he has to stay. They can do it because as soon as he goes out, I mean, I had a client that went out to the front door to the porch to get a package and they went, boom, where are you? Why did you leave the perimeter of your home? So there are orders and conditions that can be set to allow this guy to not be incarcerated while waiting for trial. Now, honestly, do I give a crap where he is uh, just as like a regular person who is not white, who has lots of clients that get incarcerated and held pretrial? I mean, not really, but yes, as a person who has lots of clients who are held pretrial, um, I, don't, I don't see any reason why this guy needs to be held any more than anybody else. I mean, he has no prior criminal record. He has serious mental health issues. And he has substance abuse issues. So you can, you can formulate orders and conditions. You can. You absolutely can. Will they? I don't know. We'll have to wait and see what happens. I mean, he is very white. Um, and he is from Arizona. I, and I don't, I don't practice in Arizona, so I don't know what their, what their uh, propensities are in those courtrooms. But I, I, I don't think that he needs to be held pretrial. I think that he can actually be released. And there's a way to make sure he comes back to court. And here's the other thing. 
if you go, that's another charge. Like you can't just go. If he goes and he breaks the law, you can bring him back and then you don't even have to worry about it. Like you're in, it's easy. It's so much easier for everybody. I, I'm afraid that this is just a show um, because they love locking people up in advance. I mean, they love locking white people up too, if they can. Don't, don't get it wrong here. They do like it. But what really bothers me about the government's and again, this is all on trialserrors.com. Um, it's our brand new blog that you know will help us along this journey as we go through it. What bothers me is that on page nine, it actually misstates what the Bail Reform Act says. It says, as the court is no doubt aware, the Bail Reform Act requires a district court to order a defendant detained pending trial if no condition or combination of conditions will reasonably assure the appearance of the person as required. Okay, so that's number five on the list. That's that's 18 USC 3142E. And if you go, you can see I, I gave you a link to the Bail Reform Act as well, E, right? So before E, there's a, B, C, and D. A, B, C, and D talk about release, right? A, B, C, and D say you should release them if, and here's another way you can release them, and here's a fourth way you can release them. The fifth thing is if there are no orders and conditions, no way at all that you can fashion anything. And these people mean to tell me with the entire might of the United States government, they can't figure out any way to keep this guy who believes that he's a shaman with a spear and was sent by God to the Capitol, they can't keep him from going back to the Capitol. I mean, what happened to American exceptionalism? Yeah, I agree with you, Nicholas. I think that Q Shaman wants his time in the sun. I mean, he went to, when he went to the FBI, yes, I, that's, that's true secret squirrel. They were worried about his ability to raise a lot of money but they can also, I mean, freeze his bank accounts. That's a thing that they do all the time, right? And even if he raises a lot of money, he has to be able to leave his house. And if he's on a GPS, he can't leave his house because as soon as he leaves his house, they will know that he's left his house. So it, whether or not he has money is not the point. I mean, if he has money, he's sitting home, he can just buy a lot of Cheetos, you know, from walmart.com. Um. But I think that, you know, this idea that people need to be held because our government can't figure out how to release people is a lie. And I think that, you know, oh, oh, I was talking about something else. When he showed up at the FBI, he said he was going to the Arizona State Capitol. He told the FBI, from here, I'm going to the Arizona State Capitol. And in his car, in his Hyundai, right, because he drives a Hyundai, because he's, you know, thinking about, you know, mileage and they still have that, you know, 10 years, 100,000 mile warranty. I mean, it's, it's smart. I think it's smart. Um, he told he told them he had all of his equipment in the car. So he had his horns in the car, he had his furry cap in the car and his spear. He had it all in there. So this guy clearly thinks that he's doing right. He's, he's, he's doing the right thing. So he needs mental health treatment. He needs help. Um, and pretrial services can, can order that help. Um, there was something else in here um, other than his anybody else have any questions oh I guess Justin says the judge's order didn't order organic food it said that the attorneys and U.S. Marshals should figure it out I mean I don't know maybe Maybe people should get organic food. Why shouldn't they get good, good food in prison? I don't know. Why shouldn't they? Does he want his time in the spotlight? I think he does. But I don't think it's the same extent as some of these other people want it. I think that he has now become the figurehead um, of QAnon. I mean, he, you know, one of the other things they said uh, that was a reason to keep this guy detained was that without his costume on, you can't really tell who he is so he just kind of blends in like any other white guy um i think he's bald um there's a picture of him i think with rudy giuliani maybe at the trump hotel um 
Justin asked, do you think there is a decent chance that one or more members of Congress will get charged? I don't know. Well, um, Kitty, they will, they will not only cancel his passport, they'll, well, they'll take it from him. They'll take his passport. He won't physically have a passport. And one of the orders and conditions will be that he cannot get a new passport. And again, if he's on an ankle monitor, he can't leave his house. So the second he leaves his house, they will know. It'll go ding, 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 ding. And that'll be that. So um, they're, you know, my clients always have to turn in their passports. That's just par for the course. They bring it to the clerk's office and they keep the passport until the case is done. So do I think members of Congress will get charged? I don't know. It depends on what plays out. Um, we're in a really funny place right now, I think, in America. Um, I, I think they should get charged. Um, Ali Alexander seems more than happy to out his relationships with people who helped set this up. Um, I did an entire video on conspiracy, and we can do another live stream some other time about conspiracies and what they are. And I'd really love to hear your questions on um, conspiracies because they are interesting. Oh, you're so welcome, Bookworm. Thank you for joining us. Um, I really, you know, like I said at the beginning of this, if you're just joining us now, I think that, you know, we lawyers go into court every day and we try to do this work. Um, but we're really just, we're, we're trench diggers, right? And we, um, we just go in there and we take our shovels and we just kind of dig and dig and dig and dig. And what we need, are we need people who understand the law and who can think about it and who can um, advocate for change because the pressure has to come from outside the system, not just within it. We, we fight within the system. And the real issue that we have is that we represent individual clients. So if my client is Q Shaman, right, I'm going to advocate for him the way that I, I just laid it out for you right now, right? That's how I'm going to advocate for him. Um, and that's how I would advocate for any of my clients. So when I go to court, I have to kind of assume that we're all on a level playing field, that everyone is equal. And we know that that's not true, right? We know that Q Shaman, um, Jake Agnelli has had privileges that most of my clients haven't had. So while I'm in there arguing that he should be released, um, knowing what terrible things he did um, and when wanted to do to this whole country, to people like me, um, the rest of you have to be out there advocating for the change that really needs to happen. And number one, honestly, is that we have to train people's minds that incarceration is not the only answer, right? I mean, that's not the answer. It's not the answer for this guy. This guy is mentally ill. He is not well. He needs help. And I, I, I'm not really sure at what point um, white males get the help that they need. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't think they do, generally speaking. I, so he needs mental health treatment. He needs substance abuse treatment. Um, and he, he needs to be deprogrammed. I mean, that's just the truth. He needs to be deprogrammed. So I need, we need your help in advocating for this change because it's enough already. I mean, I've been doing this job for 20, 20 years and the changes have been, it, some of them have been good. No cash bail is good, but we still have a lot of clients who are still in custody pre-trial because judges will say, that's fine. No cash bail, no bail, just get remanded. So it, it's not the, the things that when criminal defense attorneys say, no, 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 wait, stop. Don't, don't worry about that. Worry about this other thing. Um, we say that because we know how it actually works. So we need the activists to, to do their, their, the, the activist stuff while intersecting with those of us who see how the system plays out day to day. So that combination, I think, could be really great if, you know, if we say we need to educate society about what it means to be incarcerated pretrial. And really, what does the law say versus what do the judges do? Um, and how does it actually work? So if we actually can do that, if you all can know, hey, look, no, I know about the Bail Reform Act. I actually, I have a copy of it right here. 
that just makes it better for everybody, right? I mean, that makes it better for me. It makes it better. I mean, I don't have to be the one saying it. You can say, look, no cash bail is perfect. It's wonderful. It's great. But how are we going to ensure that people are still released? Does that make sense? And I want to do that with everything. I want to do that with, and I, and I want to see how it goes. And I need you all to join me and get your friends to join me and get them to watch the videos and subscribe to the newsletter and tell me what it is that you all want to hear, what you want to talk about, what interests you. Um, most of my family members are not lawyers. They're not criminal defense lawyers. So they'll ask me things about mandatory minimums, for example, and why do they exist? Or, you know, the, my very first video was, you know, mens rea or injunctions. What are these things? So whatever it is, I think it's important for you to know. Charles says there are groups who help people escape religious cults. I don't know that people, you know, we always say people aren't sorry for what they do. They're sorry for being caught. And I think that's true, but uh, I mean, we're not all good at dealing with consequences of our actions. So if it starts with, well, you just got caught, um, then that's where we start from, right? You got caught and now you got to deal with the consequences. So, you know, if it's just to avoid jail time, that's okay. I mean, jail time is terrible. I, I honestly, one of the worst things about my job is going to the jail. Justin loves it. He likes going to the jail. I don't like it at all. I have to be honest, I especially hate it during visiting days. I hate seeing the kids. I hate seeing the loved ones. Um, some places are okay because they can actually give each other hugs and sit across the table from each other. Um, but the places where they have to talk on the phone through glass, I really, I don't like it. I don't like jail. I mean, I hate going to jail when it's chow time. I think the food smells atrocious. Um, jail is really bad, guys. I mean, it's traumatizing. Um, it's not good. And uh, if nobody had to go, if we could devise an alternative world from incarceration in a place with bars, I think that would be, that would be great. And I do, I think it's really widespread. I mean, I used to say something that is really callous. I used to say uh, mental illness has gone mainstream. Um, and I've said this for years now, um, but I, I don't know what it is. I read this book by Kurt Anderson called Fantasyland, and I didn't love it. I'm going to be honest. I didn't love it, but it talks about America as the place where, you know, we bought snake oil and where a bunch of religious zealots came to live out in the woods with no nothing um, in order to practice a religion that was even more hardcore than what they had back home. So, you know, America's a funny place. You know, I don't know. I'm just a visitor here. Anybody have any other questions? This is so fun. Yeah. Anybody? I've been doing this for about 40 something minutes now. Um, if you got no other questions, I'm going to sign off. Everyone good? I don't know how this is supposed to end. How do we end these? Go bye. I wish we could talk to each other, though. I think it would be more fun if it was like a Zoom, right? And then we could talk to each other. Could we do that? I don't know. Thank you. I really enjoyed this. Thanks. Next time. Bye. Okay, all done.